very essence of civil liberties certainly consists in the right of every individual to claim the protection of the laws whenever he receives an injury. One of the first duties of government is to afford that protection. The government of the United States has been emphatically termed a government of laws and not of men. Howdy everybody and welcome. You are watching the Defenders of Rights. And yes, you guessed it, of course, we are bringing you another episode of Learning the Law. Now, in this episode, we're going to be covering statutes, of course, just like we've been covering in the other episodes. And they're all driving from the Indiana Code, the Indiana Administrative Code, the United States Code, the Code of Federal Regulations. We're also bringing you more definitions deriving from Black's Law Dictionary. We've got so much to cover in such little time. You're going to definitely want to stay tuned, stick with us, because this episode is another educational episode that's going to teach you everything you need to know about the law. Now, before we get started, we always want to thank the subscribers out there and all those who view our channel, who are sharing our content, who are spreading the word on the corruption occurring here in the Columbus, Indiana Republic, as well as the surrounding cities here in the Indiana Republic. There's so much corruption to go around and for all the new viewers out there checking out our content, please hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, comment to us, let us know how you feel about our content, how you think we're doing, should we do something better, because we need everybody's assistance in this battle. There's a war going on, everybody. We're on the front lines of it. And one thing's for sure, we will say this, we are damn proud of it. And of course, the biggest thanks goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. We want to thank Him for being with us every day and giving us all the blessings that he has given us for giving us the strength the courage and the wisdom to do what's right and to fight for what's right to be there for other people and to love thy neighbor just like he has commanded us to do this has been a calling we have heard his message and we are answering his commands we are trying to help our fellow neighbor out there fight against the corrupt system that we were born in so let's get to fighting together shall we in episode 3 of Learning the Law, we're going to be going over chapter 7, United States slash State of Indiana Legal Terms and Definitions. And all this derives from the document titled The Constitutionally Protected and Secured Right to Locomotion and Personal Liberty, the Right to Travel, and a Private Conveyance slash Private Automobile. And as always, I'm going to be going over what's underlined. That is the most important key information that we need to go over, so I'll continue to do just that. In the beginning of this chapter, we have Indiana Code, Title 26, Commercial Law, which is the Uniform Commercial Code implemented into the Indiana Code, making it Title 26, Commercial Law, Section 26-1-9.1-102. This is defining consumer goods and equipment. And of course, whatever state in the union you're in, you can look in your code and you'll find the commercial law, the uniform commercial code, implemented into your code. Ours happens to be Title 26, Commercial Law. Before I read off this definition, I want to remind you that a private conveyance or a private automobile are considered consumer goods. They're considered household effects, personal effects, household goods. What's the difference? Consumer goods, household goods, personal effects all deal with personal property that is for personal family or household purposes whereas equipment deals with the business aspect of things so let's go back to it section 26-1-9.1-102 number 23 consumer goods means goods that are used or bought for use primarily for personal family or household purposes number 33 equipment means goods other than inventory farm products or consumer goods Next, we have Indiana Code, Title 24, Trade Regulation, Section 24-4.7-2-3. Consumer goods or services means any of the following. Number one, tangible or intangible personal property or real property that is normally used for personal, family, or household purposes. Terms used in Indiana Code, Title 24, Trade Regulation, Section 24-4.7-2-3, are also personal property, which includes goods, chattels, evidences of debt, and things in action. And that derives from the Indiana Code, Section 1-1-4-5. Property is defined as includes personal or real property. And that's also in Section 1-1-4-5. And real property includes lands, tenements, and hereditaments. That is also in Section 1-1-4-5. Next, we have Article 10, which is Finance, Section 1 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. A. Subject to this section, the General Assembly shall provide by law for a uniform and equal rate of property assessment and taxation 
and shall prescribe regulations to secure a just valuation for taxation of all property, both real and personal. We're going to go down to C. The General Assembly may exempt from property taxation any property in any of the following classes. 1. Property being used for municipal, educational, literary, scientific, religious, or charitable purposes. 2. Tangible personal property other than property being held as an investment. And 3. Intangible personal property. And 4. Tangible property including curtilage used in a principal place of residence by an A. Owner of the property. B. Individual who is buying the tangible property under a contract. Or C. Individual who has a beneficial interest in the owner of the tangible property. Listen to D. The General Assembly may exempt any motor vehicles. Mobile homes, not otherwise exempt under this section, airplanes, boats, trailers, or similar property, provided that an excise tax in lieu of the property tax is substituted therefore. Now let me translate this for you in layman's terms. So the General Assembly may exempt any motor vehicles, as long as there's an excise tax replaced for the property tax. Remember what an excise tax is? An excise tax is put on things that are privileges, not private property. So, of course, motor vehicles, them being the conveyance used for commercial purposes, are a privilege to operate upon the streets and highways. Therefore, there's going to be an excise tax in lieu of that property, of that motor vehicle. So, even the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851 recognizes this. It separates the personal property, the tangible or intangible personal property, from the motor vehicles. There are no definitions provided in the Indiana Code for tangible personal property or intangible personal property except what's prescribed from Indiana Code Title 24 Trade Regulation Section 24-4.7-2-3, which is what we went over. There is, however, the definition of private property in the Indiana Code as well as property. Pursuant to Indiana Code Title IX, Motor Vehicles, Section 9-13-2-136, private property means all property other than public property. Pursuant to Indiana Code Title 23, Business and Other Associations, Section 23-0.5-1.5-3, property means all property, whether real, personal, or mixed, or tangible, or intangible, or any right or interest in such property. Indiana Code Title I General Provisions Section 1-1-4-5 Definitions applicable to construction of all Indiana statutes A21 Property includes personal and real property. So there's the gist of the definitions of property in the Indiana Code. Pursuant to, I have the website put up on the screen, the Department of Local Government Finance Property Tax Terms defines personal property as Personal property typically encompasses movable items that are not permanently affixed to a physical structure. Examples of personal property include farm equipment, appliances that are not built in to the structure, furniture, or similar items. Whereas personal effects are not subject to property taxation in Indiana, most depreciable personal property used in the production of income is. And as you can see, I have underlined, whereas personal effects are not subject to property taxation in Indiana, I wanted to point that out. They're not subject to property taxation. That is key and so important because automobiles, private conveyances slash private automobiles are considered personal effects, which are not subject to property taxation in Indiana. Next, we have the Indiana Administrative Code defining personal property. 50 Indiana Administrative Code, Article 4.2, Assessment of Tangible Personal Property, Section 4.2-1-1. Again, I'm just going to go over what I have underlined here because this is a big definition. Personal property means, number four, motor vehicles. Personal property does not include commercially planted and growing crops while they are in the ground, property subject to taxation under the Public Utility Tax Act, or household goods. So, as we see from the Indiana Administrative Code, personal property does not include household goods. So therefore, automobiles, private conveyances, slash private automobiles are not personal property in the Indiana Code or the Indiana Administrative Code. Next, we have Indiana Code, Title 26, Commercial Law, Section 26-1-7-209. Household goods means furniture, furnishings, or personal effects used by the depositor in a dwelling. So there, it's defining the house, household goods, and it includes personal effects in that definition. 
Next, we have Indiana Code Title 35, Criminal Law and Procedure, Section 35-31.5-2-107. Dwelling means a building, structure, or other enclosed space, permanent or temporary, movable or fixed, that is a person's home or place of lodging. I wanted to define dwelling there so we can understand household goods better. Next, we have Indiana Code Title 8, Utilities and Transportation, Section 8-2.1-17-9. Household goods means 1. Personal effects and property used or to be used in a dwelling when the effects and property are parts of the equipment or supply of that dwelling. So there again, we have personal effects included in the definition of household goods. Within the definition of household goods, pursuant to Indiana Code Section 8-2.1-17-9A1 and Indiana Code Section 26-1-7-209D is personal effects. The Indiana Code, the General Assembly, or any Indiana statute does not provide any definition of personal effects. But, in Indiana Code section 34-26-5-91B5, it provides that an automobile is included in personal effects. So here we go. Indiana Code Title 34, Civil Law and Procedure, section 34-26-5-9. Ex parte orders, relief after notice and hearing, duties of issuing court, effective dates, burden of proof, superseding orders, presumptions. Section 1B. A court may grant the following relief without notice and hearing in an ex parte order for protection or in an ex parte order for protection modification. Number 5. Order, possession, and use of the residence and automobile and other essential personal effects. I want to remind you that AND is the conjunction used in that sentence. So the residence, an automobile, and other essential personal effects. An automobile is included as a personal effect. That is important for what we are trying to convey. Since the state of Indiana does not provide a definition for automobile, we are left to locate the meaning of automobile from other sources. According to the Indiana Code, the term motor vehicle does not include an automobile within its definition. Within the Indiana Code, Indiana Administrative Code, and other sources prescribed by the state of Indiana, the term consumer goods is defined as tangible or intangible personal property or real property that is normally used for personal, family, or household purposes. The term personal property includes motor vehicles but does not include household goods. Household goods, by definition, includes personal effects and property used or to be used in a dwelling when the effects and property are parts of the equipment or supply of that dwelling. Personal effects are not subject to property taxation in Indiana. In addition to the case law describing and defining what an automobile essentially is in legal terms, in conclusion, an automobile is clearly considered personal effects, household goods, and consumer goods. A motor vehicle is considered equipment and personal property. The Code of Federal Regulations does indeed provide a definition for the term automobile. Well, so let's check it out. Title 49, Transportation, Code of Federal Regulations, Section 523.3, Automobile. A. An automobile is any four-wheeled vehicle that is propelled by fuel or by alternative fuel, manufactured primarily for use on public streets, roads, and highways, and rated at less than 10,000 pounds gross vehicle weight. I can't pronunciate that enough. The 10,000 pounds is so important to pay attention to. Why? Because you'll soon see what I'm talking about, how important the gross vehicle weight is. And in the next section, it defines passenger automobile and then non-passenger automobile, but we won't go over those at this point in time. Continuing on, pursuant to, I have the website highlighted as well as put up on the screen. It's a commercial motor vehicle guidebook in the indiana.gov website. Indiana has adopted the following federal motor carrier safety regulations as Indiana law. A commercial motor vehicle is any self-propelled or towed motor vehicle used on a highway in interstate and or intrastate commerce to transport passengers or property when the vehicle has a gross vehicle weight rating, gross combination weight rating, gross vehicle weight or gross combination weight of 10,001 pounds or more or is designed or used to transport more than eight passengers, including the driver, for compensation, or unless the vehicle otherwise meets the definition of CMV, 10,001 gross vehicle weight rating. So as you can see, a commercial motor vehicle is 10,001 pounds or more. 
an automobile is 10,000 pounds or less. The difference is one pound. That is not a coincidence, ladies and gentlemen. That was intentional, put there for a purpose, for a reason. I'll let you decide what to think about that. Next, Indiana Code Title 6, Taxation, Section 6-6-4.1-1. B, Commercial Motor Vehicle, means a vehicle which is listed in Section 2A of this chapter and which is not excluded from the application of this chapter under Section 2B of this chapter. K defines motor vehicle, and L defines recreational vehicle, which means motor homes, pickup trucks with attached campers and buses when used exclusively for personal pleasure. A vehicle is not a recreational vehicle if the vehicle is used in connection with a business. Obviously, because then it wouldn't be a recreational vehicle, it would be a motor vehicle. Because that's the conveyance tied with businesses conducted upon the streets and highways. Next, we have Indiana Code Title VI, Taxation, Section 6-6-4.1-2. Applicability of Chapter. B. This chapter does not apply to the following. Let's go down to 5. A recreational vehicle. 6. A pickup truck that C. Is operated solely for personal use and not for commercial use. So what this points out is that the Indiana Code does recognize that there are conveyances used for commercial purposes and there are also conveyances used for personal reasons, for private purposes. It acknowledges that. And so if it acknowledges that, obviously it acknowledges the law. And the law is they cannot condemn you for not having a driver's license or not registering your, your private conveyance slash private automobile if you're not using the streets and highways for commercial purposes. Next is 45 Indiana Administrative Code, Article 13, Motor Vehicle Fuel Tax, Section 13-1-3, Defining Motor Vehicle. A motor vehicle means a vehicle that is propelled by an internal combustion engine or motor and is designed for highway use. B. Vehicles designed for highway use are vehicles primarily adapted for and engaged in highway transportation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, means commerce. All vehicles plated for general highway transportation or capable of being plated pursuant to Indiana law are presumed to be primarily adapted for and engaged in highway transportation. Going down to C, the term motor vehicle does not include vehicles not required to be registered under Indiana Code Section 9-18 including the following vehicles when used entirely on private roads 1 road construction or maintenance machinery 2 vehicles not capable of being plated pursuant to Indiana law so on and so forth let's go down to 7 vehicles exclusively operated on private property and not engaged in highway transportation that could be worded another way and we're about to cover that D the term motor vehicle includes vehicles with a common fuel reservoir for both locomotion along the highway and the operation of equipment with another commercial purpose. And then it goes on to find commercial purpose. For purposes of Indiana Code Section 6-6-4.1, commercial purposes, one, means the exchange of goods and services and contemplation of profit, and two, includes non-proprietary functions of governmental agencies and not-for-profit organizations. That's what the United States Code says, that's what the Code of Federal Regulations say, that's what case law says, that's what the Black's Law Dictionary says. You can find this stuff anywhere. Next we have Area Interstate Trucking versus Department of Revenue. This is the Tax Court of the Indiana Republic in 1992. End quote. Vehicles exclusively operated on private property and not engaged in highway transportation are not motor vehicles. Another way of saying this is, vehicles that are exclusively private property and not engaged in highway transportation are not motor vehicles. That's the same thing covered right there. I thought that was interesting and I wanted to point that out. Next we have 45 Indiana Administrative Code, Article 12, Gasoline Tax, Section 12-1-8, Defining Motor Vehicle. And it defines it the same way as what we just previously read in the Indiana Administrative Code. What's different in this section is that it has examples, as you can see. I'm going to read what's underlined to you. Although the automobiles designed may be for highway use, such cars are neither adapted for nor engaged in highway transportation and therefore would not be considered motor vehicles. I can't express enough how important that sentence is. So if you read the beginning, one, an automobile manufacturer tests cars on a test track located on the manufacturer's property. 
During such testing, the cars are neither fully equipped nor assembled. Although the automobile's design may be for highway use, such cars are neither adapted for nor engaged in highway transportation and therefore would not be considered motor vehicles. And since they're acknowledging this, it's the same concept for those who have private conveyances slash private automobiles. They would not be considered motor vehicles because they're used solely for private purposes. And it blows my mind that these public officials all across this country are dumbfounded when they hear about the right to locomotion and personal liberty, the right to travel, and how we have the right to use the streets and highways and our private conveyances slash private automobiles without registering them, without obtaining a driver's license. It blows my mind. There is a pre-assumption that all vehicles plated for general highway transportation or capable of being plated pursuant to Indiana law are presumed to be primarily adapted for and engaged in highway transportation. So, if a private citizen is traveling in a private conveyance slash private automobile upon the streets and highways of the Indiana Republic, it is presumed that that private citizen is engaged in highway transportation, also known as commerce, meaning that private citizen is using the streets and highways for compensation or for hire. This preassumption becomes fact in a court of law until rebutted, and when it is rebutted, all alleged charges should be dropped and the case dismissed with prejudice. The Indiana Code definition of a motor vehicle is a self-propelled vehicle or is a vehicle that is propelled by an internal combustion engine or motor and is designed for highway use. Vehicles designed for highway use are vehicles primarily adapted for and engaged in highway transportation. A commercial motor vehicle is also included as a motor vehicle by definition. A motor vehicle also has a gross vehicle weight rating of at least 10,001 pounds or more. The United States Code defines motor vehicle in Title 18 Crimes of Criminal Procedure as every description of carriage or other contravance propelled or drawn by mechanical power and used for commercial purposes on the highways, in the transportation of passengers, passengers and property, or property or cargo. The term used for commercial purposes means the carriage of persons or property for any fare, fee, rate, charge, or other consideration, or directly or indirectly in connection with any business or other undertaking intended for profit. Pursuant to Vehicle Classifications in Title 49, Transportation of the United States Code, an automobile is defined as any four-wheeled vehicle that is propelled by fuel or by alternative fuel, manufactured primarily for use on public streets, roads, and highways, and rated at less than 10,000 pounds gross vehicle weight. Pursuant to the Indiana Code, a gross vehicle weight rating is the value specified by the manufacturer as the loaded weight of a motor vehicle, and the gross vehicle weight is the weight of a vehicle without load plus the weight of any load on the vehicle. In addition, the term automobile is also found in the Indiana Administrative Code. It is considered a motor-driven conveyance. The Indiana Code does not define conveyance, so we must search elsewhere for the definition of conveyance. In Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 333, the definition of convey is to transfer or deliver to another, to pass or transmit the title to property from one to another, to transfer property or the title to property by deed, bill of sale, or instrument under seal, used properly in sense of assign, sale, or transfer, see conveyance. On the same page in Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, the definition of conveyance is in its most common usage, transfer of title to land from one person or class of persons to another by deed. Term may also include assignment, lease, mortgage, or encumbrance of land. Generally, every instrument in writing by which an estate or interest in the, re in the realty is created. See also alienation, demise, fraudulent conveyance, involuntary conveyance, so on and so forth. Absolute or conditional conveyance means an absolute conveyance is one by which the right or property in a thing is transferred free of any condition or qualification by which it might be defeated or changed as an ordinary deed of lands in contradistinction to a mortgage which is a conditional conveyance. Conveyance means the right or property in a thing is transferred. Black's Law Dictionary 6th edition page 1497 transfer is defined as to convey or remove from one place, person, etc. to another, pass or hand over from one to another, specifically to change over the possession or control of as to transfer a title of land, to sell or give. The Indiana Code or the Indiana Administrative Code or any other Indiana legal source does not contain the definition or term of conveyance when dealing with a vehicle. 
The Indiana Code and the Indiana Administrative Code does, however, recognize conveyance as an instrument to transfer or deliver persons or property from one place to another. A conveyance is defined as a means of passage. Next, we have 1312, Indiana Administrative Code, Article 9, Fish and Wildlife, Section 9-1-10. Motor-driven conveyance means 1. An automobile, 2. A truck, 3. A tractor, 4. A combine, 5. A wagon, 6. A bus, 7. An off-road vehicle, 8. A recreational vehicle, 9. A motorcycle, 10. A moped, 11. A dun buggy, 12. A go-kart, 13. A motorboat. 14 an airplane or 15 other motorized conveyance capable of transporting an individual. Notice that a motor vehicle is not included in the definition. Let's go further with this concept. Title 50 Wildlife and Fisheries Code of Federal Regulations Section 20.21 What hunting methods are illegal? D. From or by means, aid or use of any motor vehicle, motor driven land conveyance or aircraft. That's what I have underlined, and that's what's important there. The conjunction word is OR, separating motor vehicle from motor-driven land conveyance or motor-driven conveyance. They're different. 50 Code of Federal Regulations, Section 20.21, is acknowledging that there are different meanings for a motor vehicle and a motor-driven land conveyance. The legislative intent was to separate the two because of the distinctions involved with a motor vehicle and a motor-driven conveyance. Motor vehicles are specifically used for private gain, commercial purposes, and a motor-driven conveyance is used for something except for commercial purposes. A motor-driven conveyance means an automobile or other motorized conveyance capable of transporting an individual. The phrase capable of denotes that there is a possibility of transporting an individual. Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 1166, defines possible as Capable of existing, happening, being, becoming, or coming to pass. Feasible, not contrary to nature of things. Neither necessitated nor precluded. Free to happen or not. Contrasted with impossible. In another sense, the word denotes improbability without excluding the idea of feasibility. So, the legislative intent is to denote that a motor-driven conveyance is not a motor vehicle. So, basically what we're doing here is... Every statute, every code that is created, we have to dissect it word by word. We have to define the words that are placed into the statute or code. Why? Because we need to understand the intent and purpose and meaning of the legislature. And yes, most of everything that's created by the legislatures of the States of the Union as well as Congress is ambiguous. Ambiguous means the common layman, such as we the people, don't understand what they're trying to convey. And so that's what we're doing here, and we're going to continue to do that in this episode. In the Indiana Administrative Code, an automobile is a motor-driven conveyance capable of transporting an individual. The Indiana Code does not define transport or transportation, so we must, again, look to other sources. Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 1499, transport is defined as to carry or convey from one place to another. On the same page of Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, the term transportation is defined as the movement of goods or persons from one place to another by a carrier. Title 49 Transportation, United States Code, Section 5102.13 defines transports or transportation as the movement of property and loading, unloading or storage incidental to the movement. Transporting and transportation, by legal definition, are two different terminologies. Transportation is the movement of goods or persons by a carrier. Title 49, Transportation, United States Code, Section 13102, Number 23, defines transportation as A. A motor vehicle, vessel, warehouse, wharf, pier, dock, yard, property, facility, instrumentality, or equipment of any kind related to the movement of passengers or property, or both regardless of ownership or an agreement concerning use, and b. services related to that movement, including arranging for, receipt, delivery, elevation, transfer and transit, refrigeration, icing, ventilation, storage, handling, packing, unpacking, and interchange of passengers and property. Transportation is commerce, which is regulated by the state of Indiana, but mainly by Congress. A motor-driven conveyance can infer two distinct classifications, 
One is being that the words driven and transporting are used with this term and one can only assume that these words are grammatical variations of their counterparts. Driven derives from driver, drive, etc. and transporting derives from transportation. All of these words or terms are used within commerce. The other inference is that motor driven conveyance is not defined as a motor vehicle nor does it correlate with a motor vehicle which indicates that it is a term used for the private sector. But never assume. Like the old saying goes, everything will be used against you in a court of law. The Indiana Code does provide a definition for mode of transportation in the Indiana Code Title 36 Local Government Section 36-8-12.2-4. Let's go to that. Indiana Code Title 36 Local Government Section 36-8-12.2-4. Number 10. Mode of transportation includes but is not limited to carriage by a motor vehicles or e other means of transportation in commerce. Mode of transportation includes but is not limited to carriage. That is key. The definition of carriage is according to Black's Law Dictionary 6th edition page 214 transportation of goods, freight, or passengers. In other words, a carriage by legal definition is associated with commerce. The Indiana Administrative Code also defines carrier. 45 Indiana Administrative Code Article 13 Motor Vehicle Fuel Tax Section 13-1-1 Carrier means a person who operates or causes to be operated a commercial motor vehicle on any highway in Indiana. There it is. So carrier correlates with commerce. Next, Title 49 Transportation United States Code Section 13102 3 The term carrier means a motor carrier, a water carrier, and a freight forwarder. Number 14, motor carrier. The term motor carrier means a person providing motor vehicle transportation for compensation. 16, the term motor vehicle means a vehicle, machine, tractor, trailer, or semi-trailer propelled or drawn by mechanical power and used on a highway in transportation. And then number 23, the term transportation includes a, a motor vehicle or equipment of any kind related to the movement of passengers or property or both regardless of ownership or an agreement concerning use, and B, services related to that movement, including arranging for, receipt, delivery, elevation, transfer and transit, refrigeration, icing, ventilation, storage, handling, packing, unpacking, and interchange of passengers and property. All of that was self-explanatory. And we also have obtained the definition of carrier from Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 214, which means individual or organization engaged in transporting passengers or goods for hire. Carrier means any person engaged in the transportation of passengers or property by land as a common contract or private carrier or freight forwarder as those terms are used in the Interstate Commerce Act as amended and officers, agents, and employees of such carriers. Again, self-explanatory. Next, we have Anderson v. Fidelity Casualty Company. This was the Court of Appeals of the New York Republic in 1920. Some interesting stuff in this court case that I want to point out. The term common carrier is not of statutory origin. With the development in traveling facilities from the post horse to the chase, the stagecoach and to the modern railroad train or steamboat, the term common carrier has been applied to each new development catering to the public generally, and the strict rules of the old law have been relaxed but little. For with the development came new dangers of a mechanical sort inherent to swiftly moving machines. Listen to what this court says next. Definitions are fundamental. Their application to any given state of facts, therefore, must be by analogy. So the courts also acknowledge how important definitions are. They play a fundamental part in determining the law. Further in this court case... The distinction between a common carrier and a private or special carrier is that the former holds himself out in common, that is, to all persons who choose to employ him, as ready to carry for hire, while the latter agrees, in some special case, with some private individual to carry for hire. The employment of a common carrier is a public one, and he assumes a public duty, and is bound to receive and carry the goods of anyone. On the whole, says Professor Parsons, it seems to be clear that no one can be considered as a common carrier unless he has, in some way, 
held himself out to the public as a carrier, in such manner as to render him liable in an action, if he should refuse to carry for anyone he, who wishes to employ him. A common carry is one who, by virtue of his calling, undertakes, for compensation, to transport personal property from one place to another for all such as may choose to employ him. And everyone who undertakes to carry for compensation the goods of all persons indifferently is, as to liability, to be deemed a common carrier. The next sentence is also important. The tendency of the law is to eliminate distinctions which no longer continue in the mind of the ordinary man. Interesting. Continuing on, the owner of a public conveyance is a carrier, and the driver or the person managing it is his servant. Neither of them is the servant of the passenger, and his asserted identity with them is contradicted by the daily experience of the world. The words public conveyance provided for passenger service and propelled by gasoline are to receive a reasonable meaning. All conveyances are either for public or private use. The automobile, in this case at bar, was not for merely private use. It belonged to a company which, as already stated, was engaged in the business of hiring automobiles for general public use. The use of no one of its machines was limited to any particular person, but anyone able to pay the price for the privilege of riding in it while it was under the control of and being operated by one of the company's employees could do so. So obviously, this court case acknowledges that definitions are fundamental. It also acknowledges that all conveyances are either for public or private use, which is very important going forward in what we're trying to convey with our public officials that this is the law. This is what you abide by. This is what you uphold. The intended use of one's conveyance determines its application. A conveyance can be used for commercial purposes or for general purposes, such as for personal reasons, which is in private capacity and not for public use, profit, or gain. The remedy exists when those traveling avoid government contracts or franchises and start understanding the law and applying it. The United States courts must prove that those who are traveling are acting in commerce to have jurisdiction over their actions. No statute can be written to abridge or restrict a pre-existing right unless it is specifically mentioned in that act. As no such specificity exists in any motor vehicle act, then a constitutional private citizen of the Indiana Republic or American citizen or state national can reasonably infer that the common law constitutional right to locomotion and personal liberty, the right to travel, has not been infringed upon. As stated in Fitzgerald v. State, the Supreme Court of the Indiana Republic in 1970, Constitutional rights have occupied a sacred position in our legal system, and rightfully so. The concepts, principles, and rights embodied in both the United States and Indiana Constitutions command the most sensitive protection the courts can provide. In fact, protection of all constitutional rights is our most solemn duty. Every constitution of each state of the Union and the Constitution for the United States of America establishes the absolute fact that every private citizen has unalienable slash inalienable rights endowed by their creator, one being the right to travel, and the constitutions were created to protect and secure these inherited and unalienable slash inalienable rights of every constitutional private citizen of the Indiana Republic, American citizen, or state national. This ultimately confers that every public official, whether it be judges, magistrates, law enforcement, politicians, congressmen, etc., has a constitutional oath to uphold, defend, and protect the inalienable slash inalienable rights of every man, woman, and child. And next, we provide you with 140 Indiana Administrative Code, Article 7, which is the Driver's License Division, Section 7-1.1-1. This has a list of definitions that you most definitely want to check out like commercial driver's license commercial motor vehicle driver and all deriving from the code of federal regulations and the united states code it's got vehicle driver's license driver's license branch commissioner full legal name endorsements operator's license lawful status all of it indiana resident person all of these definitions you want to take a look at state Pursuant to this website, which I have highlighted and put up on the screen, which is found in courts.indiana.gov, it is the Electronic Citation and Warning System, ECWS. Before I mention what it states, 
This is specifically on the indiana.gov website. Everybody can access this and see what it says. So for those of you who are looking at this from Georgia, from California, from Utah, it's going to say something very similar on your State of the Union website. Go check it out. Here's what the indiana.gov says. I'm going to read to you the underlined parts. In cooperation with the U.S. Department of Transportation, ECWS produces a uniform traffic ticket, a UTT, that identifies commercial drivers. The ECWS initiative is an addition to and the next step in the BMV project, which allows courts and clerks to transmit serious infractions by a commercial driver to the BMV electronically instead of by mail or fax. So anytime someone gets pulled over and gets a traffic citation, they're going to receive a UTT, a Uniform Traffic Ticket. From the Indiana Republic, who have received a traffic ticket, pull it out. Check it out. You'll see at the top, in parentheses, UTT. So whatever officer pulled you over and cited you for whatever statute you violated, he's condemning you as a commercial driver. You're operating upon the streets and highways for commercial purposes. Because you got that driver's license. Those are material facts that need to be disclosed to every man and woman who go to the Department of Motor Vehicles or the Bureau of Motor Vehicles to apply for a license. Why? Because our rights are involved. And the BMV employees are public officials. They are bound to uphold our rights, respect our rights, defend and protect our rights. But like the rest of the public officials, they could care less. Not all of them. There are some good public officials out there. I am not condemning them not one bit. I respect them to the utmost. I will give respect wherever respect is deserved. There's bad in everything, unfortunately. I just thought that was interesting that the Indiana.gov website reveals that. Strictly dealing with the state of Indiana, the conclusion of the ECWS is whenever a private citizen receives a UTT, Uniform Traffic Ticket, it indicates that the constitutional private citizen is a commercial driver who allegedly committed an infraction, a violation, or other crime while operating a motor vehicle upon the streets and highways within the state of Indiana. The UTTs are explicitly for commercial drivers only, not private travelers. Next, there is a chart below to assist visually in identifying the distinctions between an automobile and a motor vehicle. The sources with the information of the distinctions identified in the chart can be located in the Indiana Code, Indiana Administrative Code, United States Code, Code of Federal Regulations, Case Law, etc. This document has condensed all of the required and relevant information from the sources mentioned for time efficiency to fulfill the overall intent and constitutional purpose of the law. A automobile slash motor vehicle chart showing you the distinctions between both. Got it all right here for you ladies and gentlemen. There it is. The left column is the distinctions, the middle column is the automobile, and the right column is the motor vehicle. Pause it on the screen. You can take a look. Please do. That way you can understand the difference. A lot of people don't think this is a big deal. But any time our judicial system violates our rights on a consistent basis, any basis whatsoever, it is a big deal. What's that old saying? If you don't flex your muscles, you won't have any. Same concept goes with the rights. If you do not invoke or exercise your rights, you don't have any. Now I'll tell you, the defenders of rights won't ever stand for that. If you ain't exercising or invoking your rights, you can bet your ass you're going to find us right next to you doing it for you. As well as exercising ours. Because I don't want my children growing up in a world full of chaos. Now that sums it up for this episode. The next chapter we're going to be covering is Chapter 8, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution for the United States of America, and the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816 and 1851. And sorry to say it again, but we have ran out of time. This sums up this episode of Learning the Law. Please tune in next time. As always, we got the law coming to you because knowing the law has become a valuable thing in our society. And we, the Defenders of Rights, are proud to show you how to defend your rights.